Hi, I'm State Senator Bruce Tarr. I'm the minority leader of the Massachusetts State Senate, and my hometown is Gloucester. I have the honor of representing 17 communities in the northeastern part of Massachusetts. I'm also honored to be the co-chair of the Great Marsh Revitalization Task Force, a truly grassroots organization that's comprised of all of the stakeholders in restoring beautiful places like Joppa Flats over my shoulder to the nature that they should have. And a lot of that involves eradicating the Phragmites plant because Phragmites is a problem all across our state and it's well known to coastal communities. But up until now, there hasn't been a focused, comprehensive effort to try to address it. That's what's so special about this task force. The fact that stakeholders came together and decided that in a comprehensive, coordinated way, we would find solutions to an invasive plant that has been plaguing us for decades. But one of the key elements to this entire project has been understanding exactly how to address all of the problem so that we address migration, so that we isolate intensive stands, and we make sure that we're able to say to all of our partners that you're part of something meaningful that's going to deliver lasting results as opposed to one-time fixes. <laughs> One of the great things about the Great Marsh Revitalization Task Force is that it capitalized on the efforts of volunteers. And two of the most critical people in that category are certainly Peter Phippen and Jeff Walker. For years, these two men have been working in the Great Marsh, trying to understand problems and address issues one at a time. They did a lot of work. They were in the marsh regularly, almost every day at times, understanding what the Phragmites issues were. They were able to give us a great understanding so that when our first meeting kicked off, we started running with good information that Peter and Jeff developed. They've got a lot of help, and they've integrated with a lot of different people. But the one thread of consistency in this task force has been the work of Peter Phippen and Jeff Walker. Beyond that, we've had tremendous participation by folks who are really invested in the process. And you're going to hear from a lot of them along the way. But note carefully that they sound a common theme, whether they are from the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Department of Environmental Protection, our folks from the Department of Interior and the Wildlife Service. Whomever speaks to you is going to tell you about one thing, the fact that they're invested in a project that's larger than any one agency. And that's not only true of state agencies, it's true of federal agencies, and it's true of local agencies. So listen carefully. As you see the personalities, the individuals, the expertise, they've all got something special to say. We're going to let them say it to you directly. But bear in mind the fact that they are part of a fabric that's been woven together by the common interest of doing the right thing for our great marshes and addressing the Phragmites problem, which all too often is something that folks throw up their hands and say simply can't be confronted. The folks that are going to speak to you actually prove that it can be. Uh, my name is Tim Simmons. I'm a restoration ecologist with the Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program with the, the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. We're at Pilot Island Creek in Newberry, Massachusetts, and the background is the Great Marsh, the largest salt marsh in New England. More people than not that I'm acquainted with have never been out on the marsh. They have no idea that we have this wilderness system in our backyard with all these riches that we've described. And I'd like to change that to uh, the extent possible. Um, but whether or not they ever get out on the marsh, they need to understand that that marsh is preventing the inland areas from catastrophic flooding. And uh, it serves uh, as a, a buffer in its natural state to storms that would be just devastating to this area if the marsh was not there or if the marsh fails in any way. It's uh, incalculable, the values that it's bringing to our lives, whether you ever see it or not. I tend to think of Phragmites as both a, a disease and a symptom of disease. It alters a system it invades. Now we see seeds that are almost 100% fertile. And what's happening is this is a wind-pollinated plant, and we've had this stock that's been delivered from all these various different places, and the wind is blowing them together and making this super Phragmites that has more viable, but it's also uh, hardier in a lot of these uh, harsher conditions. So the longer a, a stand has been there, 
the tougher it's going to be and the more genetically diverse it's going to be and the more, uh, the more viability that seeds will have. We're down behind uh, Rings Island next to Ferry Road and as you can see this is a very significant stand of Phragmites. If you were to walk straight through these Phragmites you'd end up in the Atlantic Ocean probably right where the Merrimack River meets the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the osprey poles beside us. In fact, there's a late nesting osprey you can see on the third pole down. There's nothing growing here. All our native vegetation is definitely just outcompeted. The sun's taken away. It's created its own habitat by all the thatch lying on top of each other and trapping fresh water. I mean, this plant, I'll tell you, when you talk about danger in, in the reeds, this is a perfect example. What you're looking at right now is the plant I hate the most. <laughs> this is my enemy. This is what I've dedicated a large part of my life and Peter Fippen and Greg Moore. I'll tell you what, we have got to be able to stabilize our marsh and fight back the invasives because the marsh can't do it by itself. When the wind blows that Phragmites, they almost seem pretty. We just walked only five or six hundred yards into that and it was so thick, it was hard walking, there was no native vegetation underfoot. It is totally taking away our broad marsh, our broad marsh that is so valuable. Our marsh needs help and our great marsh cannot do it by itself. We need to help the great marsh. This is an invasive, destructive plant. Okay, Grant, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some natural plant communities here in the marsh. And we're going to first look at a healthy marsh in the high marsh system. And then we'll look at the Phragmites habitat afterwards and we'll compare how similar and different they are, okay? Okay. Let's do it. This looks like a good spot right here to, to show the diversity of a high marsh system. Let's take a quick peek. Now, Look around at all these different patterns on the marsh. How many different species of, of plants do you see? How many different kinds of plants do you see? And you don't have to know their names. Well, Take a I guess. See, I see one. Okay. Two. Three. Four. Five and six. Okay, that's pretty good. It turns out there's probably as many as 12 or 13 species of grasses and herbs right in here. One of my favorites is right here. Looks like it got broken off. Yeah. It's a seaside goldenrod. And it likes to grow in the high marsh. Would you like to hold some? There you go. Now squeeze that. All right, so all that dead plant material holds water in the marsh. And when the seawater comes up over the marsh, the salty seawater stays trapped in the, in the peat, in the roots, okay? So here's native marsh peat and the native roots. We're gonna take a look in a few minutes at Phragmites and we'll see how far that plant's roots go down. It's very different. Yep. Well, this is much deeper down and you see some big roots. You wanna pull that root out of the bottom? Sure. It's called a rhizome. It's a little piece we broke off with a shovel. This, runs along the ground like this and puts shoots down that way and it'll put stems up this way. Go ahead and try and break that. Pretty tough stuff, right? Well, yeah. So this little piece of rhizome or root, this little piece can break off and drift to a different part of the marsh and start a whole new plant. Wow. Yeah. Welcome to the Great Marsh. My name is Peter Fippen. I'm a coastal scientist for the Mass Bays National Estuary Program and the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. Um, I'm standing here with my colleague Robert Buxbaum. I'm Robert. Robert Buxbaum. I'm a conservation scientist with the Massachusetts Audubon Society. The problem with Phragmites is that it, it pushes everything else out. So ultimately, in, in many Phragmites areas, um, you have nothing else but Phragmites there, and the types of birds that use that, particularly some of the rarer species, don't particularly like those Phragmites habitats. Uh, 
And so uh, generally wildlife managers uh, try to manage to prevent Phragmites invasions or to uh, reduce them when they can. And the egrets make use of uh, the pans. During the high tide, they'll actually come out and uh, feed on the fish that swim out over to the, on the marsh surface as the marsh is flooded at high tide. Um, and they also like feeding along the, the, the tidal flats in, in the rivulets and creeks. The absence of invasives in this spot, mm -hmm. and we see along the edge, as you can see, little patches of Phragmites, of the common reed, and that's an invasive species which is we're attempting to manage, and I know you're involved in some of those mm -hmm. uh, projects uh, more, than me, more than I am. Uh, but from the bird perspective, getting back to the original question you asked, that's a, that's a uh, habitat that's considered by most everyone who's looked into it not to be as v valuable for birds and other wildlife. So the fact that we have a nice diverse marsh in this Phragmites free, Phragmites free is, is a good thing for pretty much, pretty much everything. Mapping Phragmites in the Great Marsh is important for several reasons. First, for understanding the extent of the Phragmites problem within the marsh. How many acres of Phragmites are out there and how robust is that stand or those stands of Phragmites? Second, it's important for monitoring the effectiveness of the previous year's treatments. We've been treating Phragmites for several years now and every year we go out and monitor how much of the Phragmites has been killed, how much has regrown and how robust it is. And third, for providing the contractor with an accurate amount of acreages and locations for calculating his costs for treating Phragmites in the coming year. We also collect ambient surrounding vegetation, and for the purposes of identifying how robust the stand is, we will also measure the height of the tallest stems, the stem stand density, and the stand maturity, which is measured in whether seed heads are present or absent. We've been monitoring salinity in Great Marsh for the last three years, very intensely in the last three years. And the reason primarily is that we know that salinity is among the most important factors uh, that determine the presence of Phragmites or the areas that Phragmites can exploit in the marsh. Right. So when we look at Great Marsh and we start to understand the salinity gradients that exist across the marsh, we're hoping to get a better handle on where Phragmites is going to do best. We look at it both in terms of surface water salinity and salinity at various depths within the soil. It's the difference between Phragmites root depth compared to the native species. Phragmites can root a, a lot deeper and that means if we're going to monitor salinity in the marsh we need to look at various depths. Uh, EMI allows us to take conductivity measurements, gather tremendous amounts of data very quickly, keep those data in check by having some real-time salinity measurements as well. So I refer to conductivity as apparent conductivity. It's inferred um, as opposed to the real-time salinity that we collect using the SIPR. So when we combine these two approaches together, we can get an extraordinary amount of data and resolution regarding the salinity patterns on the marsh at any given day and compare them over time um, and see how those patterns change. This is really what's made EMI such a great tool for uh, guiding management out at the site. The data are, are collected on, on the spot and are on a handheld computer and we can then take all the data back to the lab and project them in a GIS-based mapping program uh, that allows us to then generate these conductivity maps that look an awful lot like a topographic map, the different lines that are shown are salinity. When we then take our, our mapped areas of Phragmites and overlay those onto the salinity contour map, we get a really um, effective tool to make predictions and to prioritize management. All in all makes the, the project much more efficient and more effective. Hi, I'm Kurt Earhart. I'm with Innovative Mosquito Management the company hired to remove Phragmites here in the Great Marsh in Newburyport, which will be using a very low ground pressure machine known as a Marsh Master. It exudes one pound per square inch over the marsh, much lighter than any human footprint can put down. We'll be using a combination of herbicides to control the Phragmites. The herbicides we use, salt of amazepir, 
is essentially a salt acid that's introduced to the plant. And this introduction blocks an enzyme specific to the plant and plants only that is used to make an amino acid that the plant needs to make food. The timing of this particular application is critical, it has to be late season because the plants, like all plants and animals, spend their time trying to reproduce. The Phragmites spends the entire summer season growing to make enough energy for the seed heads which form. And once the seed heads are formed, the plant then spends all of its time and energy moving starches and sugars back to the root system so it can overwinter. It's at, at this point where we like to introduce the herbicide because the translocation or the movement of the material from the, the top of the plants to the roots is at most advantageous. Hi, I'm Emily Sullivan. I'm the Wetlands Project Coordinator for the Northeast Mass Mosquito Control and Wetlands Management District. Um, we're here today on the Great Marsh at one of our mowing sites. Today we're mowing um, the area after it's been treated with the herbicide. Our equipment is highly specialized. Um, it's been custom fabricated to be low ground pressure. On average, they're about three pounds per square inch. Uh, the obvious benefits to having a low ground pressure machine is that you can get into wet areas, soft areas, particularly the marsh areas where Phragmites grows, and you can cause very minimal impact, if any at all. Hi, my name is Tim. I'm employed by the Northeast Mass Mosquito Control and Wetlands Management District. We're here on the Great Marsh on this beautiful sunny day. I'm sitting in a Casbah 270 piston bully, 270 meaning 270 horsepower Mercedes diesel engine. And we're here on the marsh today, uh, removing Phragmite, an invasive species, by the use of this machine, which has on the front of it a Rhino flail mower which runs at about 11, uh, 1,700 RPMs and a spinning uh, drum with hanging chain teeth that are like this. It's very effective in reducing the height of the Phragmites and exposing the ground below to air and sunlight, which then allows the native plants and seeds to rejuvenate up through and grow. So it's an essential part of any herbicide treatment program is to follow it up with typically one to two years of consistent mowing. In some cases, we're called in to mow as a fire suppression. Late in the season, Phragmites gets very dry and brittle. Even a small spark or say a cigarette thrown out a window could ignite the entire stand and it goes very quickly. Transect 1 is located upstream from the culvert that was reconstructed in 2004. Before re restoration, there was an average of about 9 meters of Phragmites. Today we have a about 4, two of which contain immature Phragmites. The Phragmites found in the latter half of the transect, in meters 20 through 30, have been completely eliminated after the installation of the new culvert. So Town Farm Road is right here. There is a little creek that runs underneath the road. Okay, and the creek is the fresh water coming into the estuary, so it's coming this way from a fresh water river, and it's headed out to the ocean. What the people who started this program did 17 years ago is they put one set of wells on the ocean side as a control. And so they called this part transect zero over here. And we have transect three, we have transect one, and we have transect two. Transects one, two, and three are affected by the culvert that goes underneath the road. Right? So there's human impact to transects one, two, and three. No human impact to transect zero. That's why it's our control group. 32 is the shallow. Medium was 30 and deep 25, right? Okay. And this is the zone where we think Phragmites has a hard time growing. It can really dominate if it's like less than 18. So doing pretty well here. 21 meters of this 30 meter transect were either bare or completely submerged with no plant life at all. This ponding could be due to runoff from the road, which is close by, or it could be due in part to changes in sea level. The salinity here ranges from 20 to 35 parts per thousand with an average of 28.8. So it is actually higher than the reference transect. 
Hello, I'm Dr. Greg Moore, a research professor at the University of New Hampshire, and I'm here with Frank Drzewski. Well, hello everyone. My name is Frank Drzewski, and I am the deputy refuge manager of this uh, beautiful place. This is Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. The salt marsh is, uh, is being threatened right now, and uh, it's being threatened by a number of invasive plants. Uh, Phragmites is probably our number one uh, enemy that have uh, come into the salt marsh, things that we're trying to control. I actually find them running into fishermen out here. What are they going after? What's the big sell here? This is a real popular spot for, uh, for surf fishing, and uh, they're going after the number one species is the uh, striped bass. And uh, the salt marsh acts as a nursery for striped bass, for a lot of fin fish, in fact. And uh, that's another thing that is, uh, is, is one of the most important things the uh, salt marsh serves is as a nursery for fin fish and shellfish. So we talked about the, uh, the fishermen. We also have uh, shell fishermen out here that dig clams, which is an important activity for the clamors and for folks that like to eat clams. And these are sustainable uh, activities as long as you, you know, we provide a healthy, healthy environment, a healthy habitat. This is such an important area for a number of reasons that we've already talked about that you know, this area is, is certainly worth protecting. Uh, number one, it's a national wildlife refuge. And uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna protect it, and uh, we're gonna do everything we can, but we can't do it alone. We're gonna we're gonna need help from uh, you know the community, and hopefully we'll come to that long-term solution someday. I think we have a really good model, working model here, and it all stems from the uh, partnerships and the uh, uh, ability to work with other groups and uh, agencies and non-government organizations. I think that's key. That's the key. Uh, if, if anyone wants to take take away from this, that's the message, is to work with your partners and work with others. There's a lot of people out there that care. Thanks so much, Frank, for taking the time, and, and thanks to you for watching Danger in the Reeds. I'd like to also thank you folks. Uh, uh, it, it's all, it's all, all of us together, working together to try to uh, you know, control these, these invasive plants and to protect this, this wonderful habitat. Thank you very much.